Again, uh, welcome to Freedom Church International. I'm so glad that you have chosen to celebrate the resurrection in this place. It's nice to see familiar faces and also some new faces, some returning folks that we have uh, missed and been out of town. Good to have you here today. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, and it would be hard to make an argument against the fact, that the, the single most defining moment in all of human history was the weekend when Jesus of Nazareth was crucified and when he rose from the dead. More things have changed in the world and been impacted by that than anything else that's ever happened. It was the single greatest defining moment. We're going to talk today about defining moments in our lives, but I want us to begin, if you want to pull out your outlines to, uh, to follow along, we're really, Scripture's just going to be our guide today. And uh, I want us to just take a moment at the outset to read uh, Mark and John's accounts of what happened on this day almost 2,000 years ago on that first Resurrection Sunday. Mark tells us when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. It was that appearance to uh, the two on the road to Emmaus that Sunday afternoon. And these returned and reported it to the rest, that is to the other disciples, but they did not believe them either. And later Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. And he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. John tells us that on the evening of that first day of the week, on the evening of the day that Jesus rose, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. You need a greeting like that when a dead man shows up in a locked room. You, you do. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And Mark tells us that Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And here's the, the pivotal line. He's, Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. We're going to talk today about defining moments. This was certainly a defining moment in history, but it was a defining moment in the lives of Jesus' closest friends. You know, it's interesting to consider how uh, unexpected defining moments can be. I love football, and, and uh, pretty much every football coach worth his salt says the same thing. They say in a football game, there are going to be three or four, maybe five plays that are going to be the defining moments in the whole game. They will determine who wins the game. And in every game, when you go back and watch it after the fact, you can pick out the, the ones that were the defining moments. The problem is you never know in advance which plays those are going to be. Life is that way, isn't it? We all have defining moments, but you don't get a notice in the mail saying, hey, Tuesday of this week is going to be one of those defining moments for you. I wonder as you think back on your life what you would identify as some of the key defining moments. When I was reflecting this week on some of those defining moments for me, it really is really kind of shocking how ordinary they are as they start to happen when you look back and realize what a huge impact they had. I think back to it was the beginning of February 25 years ago that I was at home in Tuscaloosa just watching TV, just not thinking it was a significant day. And I got a phone call from an old friend that I had lost track of two or three years earlier. He had moved away to a place that I wasn't familiar with. It was called Fairhope. And uh, he, he called me and said, uh, you know, just catching up and said, you know, I, I go to church there and uh, we're in need of a youth pastor. And I just wondered if you might know someone that you could recommend to us. And I thought and thought, couldn't come up with anybody. And anyway, we got off the phone a little bit later. I didn't think a whole lot about it. But I had no idea that night 
that a day or two later as I'm praying about that and asking Lord is there anybody I know I'm supposed to recommend to them that the Lord would say yeah you're supposed to send them your resume and that within the weeks that followed God would completely uproot me and move me to this place and how radically that would change so many different things in my life but it all started with just an ordinary phone call on the most ordinary evening think back to another defining moment it was probably about 15 years ago uh, I was just normal work day in my office in the last church that I served and I had an appointment on my schedule that a woman was coming by to see me someone I had never met before she and her family attended the church and she came in and I didn't know what she was coming in for and what she came in to do was to make an appeal that some other people had asked me at different times about and so it was one of those things I already knew the answer to because she was coming to ask me would you have any interest? I, I help uh, with a Christian school in another community. We need a place to meet. Would you be open to that school moving to your church? And I had been asked that kind of thing before. So like, I didn't even have to stop and pray about that when I said, no, ma'am, we would not. But thanks for asking. Not interested in doing that at all. Now, I thought I was nice in that moment, but I have been told many times since that I was too blunt that I was not kind at all, and the reason that I have been reminded of this a few times is because that woman's name was Jacqueline. It was the first time I ever met her. I had no idea that many years later she would become my best friend, my ministry partner, and my wife. No idea. And, yeah, and she has reminded me, you weren't nice at all to me that day. <laughs> Turned me away cold. But it would end up being one of those kind of pivotal moments that this is someone that I just meet casually, but many years later, wow. When Vicky came in this morning, I was reminded of another of those defining moments that day. I don't remember if you texted me or called me out of the clear blue seven or eight years ago. Hey, there's somebody that I think you're supposed to meet. I don't know why, but I think you're supposed to meet him. So would you meet us at, at Coffee Loft? And I'm thinking, well, if you don't know why we're supposed to meet, why are we meeting? And then of all things, I show up to meet her with a total stranger, and Vicky just drops him off and leaves. And I'm like, thanks for that. I don't know this joker, and you just dropped him off. Well, we talked and immediately struck up this friendship and just started immediately sensing this deep connection with a total stranger who's from Nigeria, and of course his name is Isaiah Kadiri, and here we are seven or eight years later. And because of that connection on an ordinary day, we have now planted five campuses of this church in Nigeria, and it all goes back to just such an ordinary day that became a defining moment. We all have these defining moments. You know, I'm convinced of this, that there are some people in the room today, there are some people who are watching online today, who didn't think today was going to be anything extraordinary. It's going to be a day maybe to have a special lunch with family or maybe have an Easter egg hunt with kids, and yet you're going to look back in your life and recognize that today, April 9th of 2023, will have been the defining moment of your life. You know, every year when I get to, particularly to Christmas and to Holy Week, those are such familiar weeks for us in the church and for those of us in ministry, such familiar stories that it's easy for it to just to be so familiar that it, it maybe loses some of its power for us. And so I always ask the Lord to give me just a fresh insight, a fresh perspective on such a familiar story. And it's always interesting to me to see what, how the Lord does that. And one of the things that he's done so many times over the years is to allow me to see like the passion narrative from a different perspective, like getting to be there as the centurion watching that. Or in, in this instance, this week, as I, I prayed for that, spent time meditating on this story, the thing that I felt so clearly drawn toward was seeing the whole passion narrative through Peter's eyes. Peter had a unique perspective because he was, it seems pretty clear, the closest friend that Jesus had on earth. Can you imagine knowing that that's true of you? Of all the people on the planet that Jesus chooses you to be his closest, most trusted friend, certainly Peter and John were the two closest, but Peter had this very unique relationship with Jesus. Over the course of the last two months, we've been in a sermon series that has just been looking at the life of Jesus throughout Mark's gospel. You may not realize Mark's gospel is actually really kind of Peter's gospel because what Mark recorded 
were, was the description of the life and ministry of Jesus as preached by Peter in Rome. So these are Peter's words record, recorded by Mark. So as we've gone through this, we've been seeing Jesus through the eyes of Peter. And as I've, as I've spent time this last week reflecting on Jesus' passion, seeing it through the eyes of his closest friends, some things have taken on a different light to me. And I want to just share some reflections from that, some insights gleaned from that. So I, I, if you'll just give me the liberty to do that, that's what I want to do today. Today's going to be a bit different. As, as I told our leadership team, this is going to be a different sermon. It's going to be a sermon with no points. So I hope it's not a sermon with no point. But uh, I want to just share Jesus' story through Peter's eyes. I believe if Peter stood in front of us today, he would say something like this. I remember the first defining moment that I had with Jesus. I remember it vividly because I had spent the entire night, the night before, fishing unsuccessfully. You see, my brother and I are fishing partners there on the Sea of Galilee. We were in partnership with another pair of brothers, James and John, and it had been the most frustrating night. We fished all night long. We did not net a single fish the entire night. So, yes... I was tired and a little grumpy that morning, and we had brought our boats up on the shore, and we were doing what fishermen always have to do. We were washing out our nets, taking care of them, getting ready to fold them up and put them up in hopes of going home and crashing and getting some rest when it happened. This guy that we had heard about, and we had actually crossed paths a couple of times, we knew his name was Jesus. We knew he was a rabbi that was attracting a great deal of attention. My brother Andrew had actually been a follower of John the Baptist for a time, and John had some pretty amazing things to say about Jesus. So we, we really had our, our ears open to all the news and all the talk that was going on about this Rabbi Jesus and the extraordinary things that he was doing. So I was a bit surprised that morning to see him with a huge crowd following him, and he's just making a beeline for me and for Andrew and our boat. And I'm thinking, what is this guy doing? And he comes up and asks if he can get in my boat. Quite honestly, I'm exhausted, and I didn't want to fool with the guy, but there was something about him and his presence that I just felt like I had to say yes. So he hopped in my boat and had us push out just a few feet from the shore. The crowd was so big, he was using that to get a little bit of separation and to create sort of a platform to speak to the people from. So I let him use my boat to do that. And as he stood and talked, I, I had to have to admit to you that I, I noticed something different about him. The way he taught, there was... There was something so genuine, so personal, and yet so authoritative in what he said. Well, he talked for a while, and when he got done, he dismissed the crowd. And I was kind of glad because I was ready to bring the boat back up on shore, go home and get some rest. But then he said an unusual thing. He looked at me and Andrew, and he said, Hey, guys, I want you to shove out one more time, and I want you to go out into deep water and cast your nets on this side of the boat. Now, I'm the fisherman. He's the religious guy. And I wanted in that moment to say, why don't you stick to teaching and I'll do the fishing? But he gave me a look and he said, I'm telling you, go out to deep water. Trust me. And as much as I didn't want to, as much as I wanted to say, it's a waste of time. You have no idea how many times we cast our nets all night. But I did it anyway, reluctantly. Andrew and I got in the boat. We went out into deep water. We threw our nets in. And what happened next, it's hard to put into words how wild it was. I had fished for years, but I had never seen a catch of fish like what we drew in in those nets. In fact, it was so big it started to sink our boat. We started screaming and yelling for James and John, get your boat and get out here as fast as you can. They brought their boat out. We loaded both boats with fish from that one gigantic catch I had never experienced nor heard of anyone who had experienced such a haul and it occurred to me as we were working our way back into shore that what had just happened wasn't natural there was something supernatural that had happened and when we got back to Jesus waiting there on the shore he had a little bit of a sly grin on his face as, as we come pulling up so many fish in the boat and I just felt overwhelmed in that moment I knew I was in the presence of someone who wasn't just an ordinary man and I got to tell you I just wasn't ready for it I fell on my knees and I asked him to leave 
I knew he must be some kind of special holy man, maybe a prophet. I wasn't ready for that, and I just asked him to go away. The strange thing is, he didn't. In fact, what he did next was so unexpected. He looked at me and at Andrew and James and John, and he made an invitation that sounded crazy. He said, guys, if you'll leave this and come follow me, I'll teach you to fish for men. Now, here's the craziest thing that happened that day. Here I am looking at the biggest windfall that I'd ever experienced in my fishing career. And here's this guy that I don't even really know saying, why don't you leave that behind and follow me? And the craziest thing that happened that day is I said yes. I've always been prone to quick decisions, and sometimes I've regretted that. But I've got to tell you, this is a decision that I've never regretted. My brother and I and our business partners, we left our business. And from that day going forward, we followed Jesus. We followed him for the next several months. And I've got to tell you, he did some extraordinary things. There were people who came to him who were sick, who were crippled, who were blind, who couldn't hear. And Jesus had this power about him that he could make all things right. When he talked, people listened. He had authority over spirits that we couldn't see. I mean, it was wild, the stuff that we experienced. And the, the number one question that the other disciples and I carried with us, but we were afraid to voice in front of him, is, who is this guy? He always seemed to be a little bit cagey about really addressing that fundamental question, especially in those early months. We wondered if he was just a great prophet, a, a great teacher, was... Was he possibly the prophet, the one that the Old Testament had promised would come just ahead of the Messiah? We really had a hard time getting our heads around who he was until the second defining moment. At least for me, it was a defining moment. It was right back here at the shores of the Sea of Galilee. We, we had set sail. Jesus wanted us to sail across to Gadara. And as we were waking, working our way across a terrible storm here. Now, I've seen a lot of storms here on the Sea of Galilee, but I've got to tell you, this was a storm unlike anything I had ever experienced before. It, it got wild and crazy, and it hit faster than any storm that I had ever seen before. Some of the other guys there with me in that group, they, they've been fishing and been on that water countless times, but we all thought the same thing. We've known of people who have drowned in these waters in bad storms, and we were afraid that day was going to be our day. We fought with everything in us to get through the storm, but the waves were just getting bigger and bigger. The boat was out of control, and we all thought we were about to die in that moment. And the wacky thing is, Jesus is in the boat, and can you believe this? He was asleep in the boat in that wild of a storm. We're rocking around violently, and Jesus is just napping. I guess I shouldn't be surprised because Jesus, when he did ministry, gave everything he had to the people. He would just pour himself into every person in the crowd one at a time and at the end of the day he would be so exhausted and he was so exhausted even in a storm he's asleep well that wasn't going to do it for us i finally reached down and shook him and said jesus do you not care that we're about to die and when he got up i don't know if i kind of ticked him off by waking him up i know i don't like to be awakened from a nap suddenly and i wasn't subtle and jesus looked at me and it wasn't with a smile and it wasn't with any warmth that he looked at me and he rebuked me and the other guys i mean he he really said i can't believe you have so little faith but then he did this thing that's so weird he turned his attention from us as if he were just looking at the storm and the water as if they were a person or something. And now he's not talking to us. He's speaking to, to the weather, to the water. And he just says with this loud voice, with all this authority, be quiet. Well, actually, that isn't what he said. What he said was, shut up. And I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but in an instant, the wind stopped blowing, the lightning stopped, and the water was suddenly calm. Now listen, I've been on the water all my life. Water doesn't instantly become calm when a storm is over, but I'm telling you, when Jesus looked at that storm and when he told it to shut up and be still, it was completely calm. I want to tell you, that was a defining moment because 
I can't fathom a human being who can look at the weather, who can look at the sea and tell it to be quiet and it has to respond. Makes me think of another defining moment. Once again on that same little body of water. We had already had some wild stuff happen that day. You see, a crowd of thousands of people had chased us essentially around the lake as we had been crossing over by boat. They caught up to us. Jesus once again just ministered to people all day long. And then when the day ended, Jesus is suddenly concerned about how they're going to be fed. And he looks at us as if we're supposed to be some fast food restaurant to feed all of these people and asks us how we're going to feed them. We don't have a way to feed these people. So we start scouring the crowd trying to find some food. And would you believe out of all these thousands of people, we only found one kid with a lunch, five loaves and two fish. I don't even understand what happened that day. All I know is we came to Jesus, one little lunch, and we're like, Jesus, here's lunch, here's the thousands. What are you going to do? And I can't explain to you what he did. He prayed, he gave thanks, he broke it up, and he told us to give it to the people. We're thinking that's going to take about 30 seconds. And all I can tell you is a couple of hours later, all of those thousands of people had been fed, and then... Jesus tells us to pick up the leftovers, and we're still thinking, leftovers? We didn't have nearly enough to begin with. He says, go get them all. Get the leftovers. There's 12 baskets left over afterwards. It's crazy. I don't understand. That wasn't even the defining moment, though. That was the confusing moment for us. But then Jesus did something that was sort of out of the norm for him. He said, guys, I want you to cross over. He told us the town that he wanted us to go to, but he said, get in the boat now. Leave and go there. I'll catch up with you later. I'll take care of the crowd. And so we got in the boat. We headed out while Jesus dispersed the crowd. He said he needed some time alone. So we started out rowing across the water. There was a little bit of a headwind. We're having a little bit of a difficult time moving in the direction that he told us to go. And so we rowed until you know deep into the night. Slow, slow progress. But I'm telling you, by midnight, one in the morning, we were only about three or four miles out into the Sea of Galilee. And at this point... What was a headwind is turning into a real storm, and now we've just got a fight on our hands. We rode and fought for hours, and I guess it must have been three or four in the morning. We are completely exhausted. Now we're just in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. The storm's getting bad, and we don't know what to do. As we're exhausted and trying to figure out what to do next, that's when things turned really weird. With a flash of lightning... That little glimpse that you get for a moment, we see something sort of on the horizon exactly back where we've come from. And we think at first maybe we're seeing a boat in the distance, but with the next flash of lightning, it's gotten a little bit closer, and we realize that doesn't look much like a boat. And as time passes and additional flashes of lightning, it's getting closer and closer, and we realize this is not a boat, this is a shape like a man. And now we start freaking out because it has to be a ghost. It is on the water. It is coming across the top of the water, and it is clearly coming on a straight line toward us. We had sort of given out a gas rowing, but let me tell you, we found some new energy. We are now rowing like crazy, not to get to the other side, but to get away from whatever is coming after us. We're not making any headway, and it's getting closer and closer. My heart was about to beat out of my chest. I didn't know what was coming, but it must not be good. And then when it gets almost to us with another flash of lightning, it occurs to me, that's not a ghost. That's a familiar figure. I think that may be Jesus. Now, you know me. My motto is ready, fire, aim. I'm always quick to act. And thinking in that moment that it may be Jesus, I called out, Jesus, if that's you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus just said, come on. I know you're going to think I'm crazy. I just jumped out of the boat. And what's crazier than that is, instead of sinking in the water, it was as if my feet had hit solid ground. And for a few seconds, I started walking on the water toward Jesus as Jesus is walking toward me, and it felt amazing. But then it was like something tripped in my brain, and I went, what am I doing? And I started looking around, and as soon as I started looking around at the storm and the waves, my feet started sinking into the water, and I started to panic 
Because I want to tell you, this is how people die. When they wind up out of a boat in this kind of water, that's how you drown. And I was afraid I was a goner, but right as I was about to go completely under, I felt Jesus' hand take hold of mine, and he lifted me up back just like he was on top of the waves. A couple of steps later, we're in the boat. Okay, that's wild, but I want to tell you, that is not the wildest thing that happened. We climb in the boat. And I can't explain what happens next. I'm just going to tell you what happened next. This time, I didn't hear Jesus say anything to the storm or to the weather. All I know is the moment Jesus' feet hit the inside of that boat, just like before, the storm was gone and the water was calm. That's not the end of what's crazy, though. We look up and we realize, now I know where we were when Jesus came to us. We were dead in the middle of the Sea of, the Gal of Galilee, but once Jesus got in the boat, somehow that fast, we were to our destination. I don't know how that happens. To this day, I can't explain it. It was a storm, then it wasn't a storm. We were in the middle of the sea, and that fast, we were on the other side. I don't understand it, but I know I didn't ever see Jesus the same after that. I, I loved him, I revered him. But there's a part of me that just doesn't even know what to make of, of this guy who not only can calm the storm, he walks on water. He moves us from here to there in an instant of time. Who is this guy? That's the question that I continued to wrestle with until another of those defining moments. You know, we had spent so much of our time ministering and working around the Sea of Galilee and in that region of the country but after we had been with Jesus for about three years, he took us, I guess the furthest north we probably ever traveled, he took us all the way up outside the country to Caesarea Philippi. It's a, it's a really striking place. There's this small mountain that has a cave on one side of it, and proceeding out of that cave are the headwaters of the, uh, the river there, the Jordan River, and hewn into the side of the rock face are all these little uh, just sort of shelves that have been man-made and there are all of these idols that are placed there to all these pagan gods so jesus takes us to this rather remote place but it's a highly religious place and against that backdrop jesus looks at the 12 of us and he asks us this question who do people say that i am well, that's a great question to ask because we've been wrestling with that for three years and different guys started to speak up and one of them said, well, you know, some say you're Jeremiah and somebody said, well, some people say you're Elijah and another said, well, some people think you're John the Baptist come back from the dead and some say that you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked the most pertinent question. Yeah, but who do you say that I am? Now, I've got to tell you, for three years I had wrestled with that question. My thoughts had sort of been all over the page as far as who Jesus really was but in that moment something clicked inside of me and I just knew for the first time I knew with certainty who I was looking at and I just blurted it out you're the Christ you're the Messiah the son of the living God and you know what Jesus looked at me and he said blessed are you Peter because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you this was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, you are Peter, which means little rock. But on this great rock, I will build my kingdom. And the gates of hell will not stand, stand against it. And I want to tell you, in that moment, I felt some pride. Like, that's right, boys. I got it right. But I want to tell you, it went from a moment of pride and satisfaction to something very different about that quickly because for the very first time right there in that moment Jesus started saying some things to us that he had never said before he said guys I need for you to understand what's about to happen we're about to start now a journey toward Jerusalem that wasn't good news for us we'd been trying to avoid Jerusalem because that's where the power brokers were that's where the people were who hated Jesus we knew that if we ever returned to Jerusalem there was a high likelihood of bloodshed or imprisonment and Jesus said we're fixing to head for Jerusalem and when we get to Jerusalem the chief priests the experts in the law the Pharisees they're going to arrest me 
they're going to torture me, and then they're going to kill me. But three days later, I'll rise from the dead. When he said that, we're all looking at each other like, is this another one of his weird parables? I mean, this has got to have some other meaning to it. But Jesus kept elaborating on just those thoughts. And finally, I just pulled him aside and said, Jesus, can we talk for a minute? I pulled him aside and said, look, I don't know what you mean by all that, but you got to quit talking like that. I mean, I know good and well that's never going to happen to you. That is not what's going to happen to the Messiah. So can we just sort of nix the talk about arrest and torture and death? That's, that's not good. And Jesus did something then that he had never done before. He looked at me in a way that I had never seen him look at anyone before. He's talking to me, but what he said was this. You get behind me, Satan, because you don't have in mind the things of God. I felt like somebody had just stabbed a dagger in my heart to hear Jesus speak to me as if I were Satan. Well, I can tell you this much. I didn't ever rebuke Jesus again for what he was talking about. And oddly enough, over the course of the next six months, as we gradually made our way southward toward Jerusalem, Jesus returned to this same theme again and again about how he's going to be arrested, he's going to be tortured, he's going to be put to death, but he'll come back from the dead. It just didn't make any sense. But we were afraid to ask about it based on what happened the last time I brought it up, so we just left it alone. Well, six months later, the week of Passover, we finally got to Jerusalem. We had talked so many times among us privately what it was going to be like, what would happen when we get there. We were scared to death. But what greeted us when we arrived was a pleasant surprise because crowds came out to meet us, and they were cheering. They were literally putting palm branches and and their coats in the road for Jesus to, to pass over on them. And they were singing and shouting praises and calling out, Hosanna to the Son of David. And so we went from being afraid to actually kind of being excited it almost felt like a parade and we were the the honored guests we went into jerusalem and i'm telling you i'm just thinking the whole time jesus let's just keep our heads down or keep our mouths shut low profile we go in we celebrate the passover privately then let's get out of dodge as fast as we can and that sunday it seemed like we might be able to pull that off jesus took us into the temple courts but it was late in the day and People had pretty much all cleared out, and Jesus sort of just walked around and looked around, and then we left. We crossed over the Kidron Valley. We went back to Bethany, and we spent the night there. And so now we're sort of on pins and needles. What's going to happen next? Can we just continue to sort of operate low-key like this? Early in the morning, Jesus got us up. He walked us back across the valley, back into the city. But, oh, my word, what happened there was the opposite of what we had hoped for. And I should have seen it coming because on that Sunday night, Jesus just had a look about him and an air about him that was so serious. It was just different than I'd ever seen before. And he's focused on making something with his hands. And at first, I don't know what it is that he's making. And the longer I watched, the more I realized he's making a whip. Never seen Jesus use a whip or drive animals before. What's he up to? Boy, did I find out the next day, because when we went back into town, we went straight back into the temple courts, right there in the court of the Gentiles, where it's all of the business is taking place. It's where the Jewish high officials send all their money men to essentially rob the people blind. It's a gigantic area with so many people buying and selling, and Jesus marched in there, and what he did was the opposite of low-key. It's hard to describe. I'd seen Jesus behave one way for three years, and suddenly on that day, he just went wild. He started turning over tables and kicking over benches and literally cracking that whip and telling people to get out of here. And he did it with such anger and authority, people just did what he said. They cleared out. And he didn't just do it in a moment of time. He stayed there all day. And as you can imagine, when he ran out those people... People who needed to be there began to trickle in. People who had sicknesses and disabilities began to come to Jesus. And you can imagine what came next. Jesus did what Jesus always did. He listened. He touched them. 
and he healed them. Well, that didn't just happen one day. He came back the next day and the next. It, it was crazy. It was like we came into town thinking, Jesus, if we could just keep a low enough profile, maybe we can sort of fly under the radar and get out before the religious leaders know that we're here. And Jesus seemed to be on the exact opposite course of that. It's like Jesus has made up his mind. I'm going to make sure that they know that we're here. If he had tried, he couldn't have done a better job of getting the attention and stirring up the anger of those religious leaders. It was like he was trying to make a point. I'm here and I'm not leaving. Well... You can imagine how much that angered them. And we saw it firsthand because on Thursday night, when we came back to the city to celebrate the Passover, we celebrated it there in Jerusalem. And there was something about that night. There was an intensity with Jesus. Oh, we spent a long time, hours at the table. It's like Jesus just had so much more to pour out to us. Something odd happened in the course of the, the meal that night. Judas, I always knew there was something about that guy. Judas has an exchange with Jesus, and then Jesus looks at him and says, go and do what you've got to do. And Judas got up and took off. I figured it was some kind of money deal that Judas is getting into, but I didn't know what was up there. But later on that evening, when we were done, we sang a hymn as we would always do at the Passover, and even though it was late, Jesus said, I want us to go back to the garden. He loved over on the Mount of Olives. He loved to spend time in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he led us, even though it was late, he led us back across the Kidron Valley, back up onto the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he told the other eight disciples to wait in a particular spot there and pray. And then he took me and James and John. He sometimes would take just the three of us with him to special moments. And he took us off to the side and guys said guys I just need you to pray with me tonight of all nights I want you to stay right here and pray and then he went a few yards further on down the way to be alone and he began to pray and I could tell something was heavy on him and I wish so badly that I could tell you that I just prayed in earnest with him but we were so exhausted it had been the most stressful week of any that we had experienced in the last three years with Jesus. We were so afraid for our lives. We were exhausted. It was late. And I tried to pray, but before I knew it, I was fast asleep. James and John didn't do much better. A little while later, Jesus came back and woke us up, and, and he just had this look of desperation in his eyes, and he said, can you not keep watch with me? Listen, the, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Please keep watch and pray. And, and he went back over to be alone and pray, and we tried to pray, but... We were so tired, we fell asleep again. And in a bit, he came back over and he woke us up again. And I, I know this sounds weird, but he was sweating like crazy. He was, he was so anxious. I'd never seen Jesus be anxious. He clearly was just so anxious in that moment. And there was something about his sweat that, honestly, it looked like he was sweating blood. He went back to pray alone again, and we started to pray again. And no sooner had we started praying than we start dozing off again and finally one last time he came over and woke us up but this time there was a different look on his face he wasn't calling us to prayer he said wake up here comes my accusers and when I got awake enough to look around and see what was going on I realized suddenly it wasn't just the 12 of us there in the garden that there was a whole mob coming toward us with torches and swords and spears and suddenly we were wide awake and we jumped up and I'm on a high alert at that moment and then of all things wouldn't you just know it Judas steps forward from the mob and he comes over and he kisses Jesus on the cheek then he steps back and it's as if that kiss signaled something because all of a sudden some of the men in that group stepped forward toward Jesus well I want to tell you I had been on high alert I was ready for that moment and that's why I had my sword at my side I reached down and I pulled out that sword and the first guy that came forward I went for his head I swung with all of my might and I came so close he ducked just in the nick of time but he didn't duck quite fast enough because I want to tell you I took off his entire ear and some of the flesh from the side of his head he went down hard screaming in pain and it wasn't a pretty sight blood was squirting with every beat of his heart and I want to tell you I brought back that sword I was fixing to finish the job when Jesus grabbed hold of my arm 
and said, put your sword away. Should I not drink the cup that my father has given me to drink? What am I supposed to do? It's so obvious these people mean harm for Jesus, but he's making me put my sword away. So I did. And then Jesus did what Jesus always does. He kneels down in the dark and he starts feeling around trying to find an ear in the dirt. And he does. This guy's rolling around screaming in pain. And Jesus slaps his ear back on the side of his head. And being Jesus, it's suddenly all well. For a moment, that just stunned the entire mob. They're just standing there like, what are we supposed to do now? And after just a moment, they sort of collected themselves. And then they just pressed in together and they grabbed Jesus and they began to bind his hands. And once they had his, his wrist bound, then they looked up at us. And I could see it in their eyes when it clicked for them. If we've got him, we might as well take them. And in just an instant, they went after the other 11 of us. It got crazy. That There was no organization, no plan. They were coming for us. They were grabbing at arms and clothes. And we were fighting like crazy just to get away. I wish I could tell you I did something heroic or courageous in that moment. But I didn't. I ran like a scared boy. I ran into the dark. In fact, I fell a couple of times. I got bloodied up along the way. It's not a safe thing to run in the dark. But I made it into a dark enough spot that they couldn't find me. And I just watched from a distance. Well, you probably know what happened the rest of that night. I followed them back into town at a distance. Even snuck into the courtyard where they had taken Jesus. And I, I watched and listened. What happened that night was just revolting. They treated Jesus as if he were a criminal, worse than a criminal. They abused him. They spit on him. They beat him. They accused him of all kinds of things that weren't true. I can't tell you everything that happened that night because I couldn't see and hear all of it. But I do know this, that by the next morning, the ruling authorities had given permission for Jesus to be tortured and murdered. So the first thing they did that morning was take him outside, tied him to a post, and a Roman soldier took a cat of nine tails and began to beat Jesus, just ripping his body to ribbons. By the next time that I saw him that morning when they forced him to carry his cross toward the hill outside the city, my friend was almost unrecognizable. I don't think there was a square inch of his body that wasn't covered in blood. I don't know how he could even be standing at that moment, but not only did they force him to stand, they put his cross over his shoulder and commanded him to carry it as they made a procession out of the holy city over to this place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Jesus is on the verge of bleeding to death already, and somehow he carried the cross for a distance. Eventually he just collapsed, and they forced someone else to carry his cross, and they drug him on over to the hill. I continued to follow at a distance watching, though it was just almost impossible to watch. There were two other men, these guys were notorious thieves, that were carried out in similar fashion. I want to tell you, they both put up quite a fight. It took a lot of soldiers to pin those guys down, to hold their arms down and their legs in place to drive the nails in their wrists and their feet. And they screamed and fought with everything in them, but they both got nailed to crosses and erected there on that hill. But when it was time to nail Jesus to the cross... It didn't take soldiers wrestling with him or fighting to hold him down. He just laid there, and though the pain was obviously immense, he let them drive those spikes in his wrist and in his feet. And when they raised that cross up and dropped the base of it in the hole, everything in me just coiled in response to that. The people who were watching started just ridiculing the three, but particularly focusing on Jesus in the center. And the most common thing that I would hear people call out to him is, if you're the Messiah, if you're the Savior, why don't you come down and save yourself? And I've got to tell you this, there's a part of me that wanted to say the same thing. Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the Savior. Why don't you do it? Why are you letting this happen? You could stop it. 
come down. Don't let this happen. But he hung there, gasping for air, having to raise himself up with every breath, slowly bleeding out minute by minute and hour by hour. I watched my closest friend bleeding to death. By noon, he had been there three hours. I don't know what happened, but the sun stopped shining. It was dark as midnight in the middle of the day, and honestly, I wondered if it was the end of the world. It felt like it to me. That darkness lasted for three more hours. Six hours, my friend hung there bleeding, gasping for air. And finally, after six hours... He had said so little. You could tell the end was near. But he cried out with a loud voice. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then with one last gasp, we all heard him cry out one final word. To tell us die. It is finished. Paid in full. And with that... He slumped over, and he stopped breathing. It was over. He was dead. I didn't feel like I could breathe. I couldn't take my eyes off of him, as sickening as it was. And then to add insult to injury, a Roman soldier, just to make sure he was good and dead, took his spear and rammed it in the side of Jesus. And he shoved it in deeper and deeper to make sure it went all the way to the heart and he rooted around and then yanked it back out and the things that flowed out just made me sick. Oh, he was dead. He was fully dead. They took his body down. One of the other followers that we had met from time to time asked for his body and I watched as they hurriedly wrapped it in linen and carried it away and placed it in a tomb I didn't know what to do I didn't know where to go I basically just aimlessly roamed the streets of Jerusalem that night trying to make sense of everything that I had seen and it didn't make any sense I just felt hopeless and empty. Eventually on Saturday, I linked up with some of the other disciples at a room that Jesus had used from time to time in the city. There weren't a lot of words exchanged between us. I could see that they were equally as empty and confused as I was. We spent the night in that room on Saturday night, though nobody slept very much. Shortly after sunup the next morning, I'd been laying there wondering what to do next. Do I go back to fishing? Where, where do I begin to pick up my life again? When suddenly there was a banging at the door. We were afraid to open the door because we were so afraid that the Jewish leaders were going to find us and do the same thing to us. We opened the door and looked to see who was outside. It was Mary Magdalene of all people. She had a wild look in her eyes, and she had a wild story to tell. She had gone to the tomb that they had put Jesus in to try and pop properly embalm his body, and she said, his body's not there anymore. Somebody has taken his body away, and that just made something snap in me. John and I both just took off on a dead sprint for the tomb. And when we got there, sure enough, the stone had been rolled away. We looked in, and we saw the the linen and the, the cloth that had been over his face, the linen that had his blood on it, they were all lying there, but there was no body. It was such a confusing moment. Something had happened, and something inside me felt like God had done something here, but I couldn't make sense of that. We ended up walking back to where the disciples were, and we stayed together for the rest of the day, trying to make sense out of what we had heard Strange reports started coming in. Some of the women who followed Jesus later that morning came in and said that they had actually seen Jesus and he was alive. And we were starting to think they were just a little touched in the head. Two disciples who had been with us, two other followers, came in late that afternoon with a report that on the road to Emmaus, 
Jesus had appeared to them alive and had talked to them. I don't know if it was Jesus' ghost or what. We were trying to make sense of that. But then as it got dark in Jerusalem and we've got the door locked, we are just hunkered down trying to stay hidden from the, the authorities. And suddenly out of nowhere, Jesus is in the room. I don't know how he got there, but he's there and he's fully alive. And it's not the ghost of Jesus. It's Jesus. In fact, he invites us to, to examine the wounds in his hands and in his side. He says, if you need to touch them, touch them. It's me. And he began to explain what had really happened. And our eyes are opened as Jesus helps us to see for the very first time this thing that seemed so insane, that seemed to make no sense, was all by God's design that for centuries the people of God had come to this place to offer blood sacrifices to try and satisfy the anger of God, trying to pay for their sins through blood sacrifices. But Jesus helped us for the first time to understand that with his suffering and death, with his shed blood, that he had become once and for all the one perfect sacrifice able to make things right between us and God. That he had to die so that we through faith in him, would not have to die for our sins. And for the very first time, it began to make sense. What Jesus helped us to understand that night is that his whole reason for coming into the world, it wasn't just to show us the heart of God. It wasn't just to show us the miracles and the power of God. It was so that he could make a way for us to become the sons and the daughters of God. He was making a way for us to belong to the family of God. In fact, my buddy John, when he set about to write down the ministry and life of Jesus, as he started in the, the opening chapter of his account of Jesus' life, here's one of the most important things John said about Jesus. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. That's what it was all about. Jesus was giving himself up for us, taking in his body all of the punishment and suffering that our failures and sin deserved so that by simply doing what John said, we could be made into the sons and daughters of God. And friends, it's just that simple. To be made right with God for what Jesus did to make any difference in your life, what John said is what we have to do. We have to believe and we have to receive. What do we have to believe? Well, we have to believe the story that I just told you. We have to believe the message of who Jesus is and what he's done. But it's not enough just to know it. You must receive. What is it you have to receive? You must receive the forgiveness of God. And you must receive this Jesus into your life to be your Lord and your King. You know, there was a time when I was knowing Jesus, but I wasn't trusting who Jesus was. In my own life, I had to come to believe that Jesus was the Savior, that Jesus was the Son of God. And there had to be a time where I actually received his forgiveness in my life. Now, I just shared with you some of the defining moments along the way for me. But I want to tell you that the most important defining moment for any of us in life is the moment that we do what John described as believe and receive. Because in the moment that you do that, something changes for all of eternity. We become the children of God. Our sins are forgiven. Our record is wiped clean past, present, and future. We now have access to God, and we have the Spirit of God living on the inside. If Peter were standing here today, I can tell you what he would say. He would say, friends, because of what Christ has done for you, respond in faith to him. Jesus said, go and tell this good news to the whole world, and those who repent and are baptized will be saved, but those who are not will be condemned. Now, I'm no longer talking to you as Peter. I'm speaking to you as your pastor. There are a lot of folks in the room that you've already known and trusted Jesus and you've received that forgiveness. 
we can celebrate today who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But there are some of us listening today that you just maybe thought you were just going through just sort of a normal Easter routine of coming to church, and God wants today to be your defining moment. What would keep you from today trusting and following Jesus? It's that simple. You don't have to rehearse it. You don't have to take a class for it. You don't have to clean up your life to receive it. You just come and receive. Would you join me as we turn to him together in prayer right now? Father, we give thanks again for the gift of your son, our Lord Jesus, and for what he's done for us. And we pray that today, in a fresh way, that Jesus would be revealed here among us. Jesus, we thank you for paying the price that we could not afford to pay. Thank you for the forgiveness that you make available to us. I want to ask a simple question. I don't want anybody looking around. If you have already received the forgiveness of God in your life, you have trusted Jesus as your Lord, would you just raise your hand as a silent testimony that that's happened? That is awesome. Scores of people. Thank you for that. Hey, as you put your hand down, take a moment to just say, thank you, God, for what Christ has done for me. And then I want to invite you to just take a moment to pray for other people in the room who were honest. They didn't raise their hand. It hasn't happened yet. We're, none of us are born right with God. We have to be born again. For those who didn't raise your hand, thanks for your honesty in that. I want to ask you a simple question. I'm not going to try and manipulate you. What would stand in the way of you today trusting Jesus as your Lord and receiving his forgiveness in your life? If that's something that you want to do, I want to ask you to just pray a simple prayer. You don't even have to say the words out loud. God is attentive to your heart. Would you just from your heart pray a prayer that says something like this? Jesus, I need you in my life. I know that I'm a sinner. I've messed up so many times. And I can't fix my own life. So I'm asking you to forgive me to come into my life and save me to give me a clean slate and a fresh start the best that I know how I'm giving control of my life to you thanks for loving me thanks for forgiving me and for saving me Father I thank you for being faithful to always answer that simple kind of prayer prayed in faith and we thank you for the gift of your holy spirit that is poured out to begin to change us from the inside out when we trust you father i pray that today you would give us confidence for people who have just put their faith in you to let that be known to somebody else before they leave this room we give you thanks for what you're doing. We ask you to help us to learn to live worthy of you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I surely hope that what you heard was relevant and helpful and above everything. I hope that what you experienced today really helped your heart to connect with the heart of God. Now, if what you heard uh, for you stirred up any questions or maybe led you toward uh, some type of spiritual decision. Maybe you want to talk with someone about something that's on your mind. I would love to hear from you. And so I would encourage you, reach out by email. At the bottom of the screen, you see my email address. It's mark at myfreedomchurch.net. That's not going to go to a secretary or an assistant. That will come directly to me. I'd love to hear from you and talk with you about anything that's on your mind. And if in the future you're in our area, we would love for you to come and worship with us at Freedom Church. But until then, we invite you to access all of the sermon material that you find online. Again, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Hope that you have a great day.